A few reminders about what we have seen during the previous lectures. So you remember we define the yes, angular radius of a star as being the ratio between its linear radius to the distance to that star. Then we, we saw that if we could approximate the energy distribution of a star with a black body, it was possible to measure the effective temperature of the star by just measuring on the ground yeah, the apparent flux and the angular radius of that star. Yeah? So it's a fantastic way yeah, to take the temperature of a star. Well, then for the case uh, of a quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, we have uh, looked at the problem of the Young's experiment with the two, two holes. <coughs> then we found that, well, even in presence of quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, we could see uh, the interferences. Yeah, as long as the difference between the two paths followed by the light rays yeah, was smaller than the coherence length, yeah, which was the square of the wavelengths divided by the bandwidth. Yeah. And typically, this was of the order of a few microns. And this is a, well, a prerequisite when you make inferometry. You should make sure that the difference in the length along the two arm, the two different arms, yeah, is smaller than just a few microns. Then we define yeah, the intensity of light as yeah, the square of the amplitude of the electric field. Then we saw uh, that Fizo yeah, already stated intuitively yeah, that if you would be looking at a star with an interferometer, well, you could start resolving the star yeah, whenever the visibility of the fringes yeah, would, would disappear, yeah, would get to zero. And uh, well, the angular size of the star would just be equal yeah, to the wavelength divided by twice the value of the baseline. Yeah, then in presence of quasi-monochromatic light, we saw that behind yeah, the, the two-hole experiment of Young, looking in, in, a, in the observer screen, the intensity distribution was given by that expression, which involves a strange quantity, which is called yeah, the complex degree of mutual coherence of the light, yeah, which appears here for the value of tau equal to zero. Yeah, and it just measure, yeah the coherence between the two electric fields here yeah, at the two apertures. Now, we saw that the visibility yeah, of the fringes yeah, was in fact given by that expression which reduced yeah, to the modulus yeah, of this uh, complex degree of mutual co coherence. Now, <coughs> well, I just stated then that this quantity is related yeah, to physical characteristics of the intensity distribution on the source. And this was the subject yeah, of uh, the next lesson. Yeah? We saw that, in fact, the visibility of the fringes yeah, is equal to the module of the Fourier transform yeah, of the normalized intensity distribution at the surface of the source. And then using a inverse Fourier transform, where we could retrieve yeah, this very important quantity with an angular resolution given yeah, by that equivalent to a single dish with diameter being of the order of the largest separation between the two telescopes. Yeah? So we need to measure many visibilities. And if we cover the UV plane, yeah, we may end up yeah, by retrieving yeah, that uh, very important quantity. Okay, now, during uh, the last lecture, yeah, what we saw yeah, is that for a converging optical system, there exists a relation between uh, the distribution of the complex amplitude of the electric field in the focal plane and the distribution of the complex amplitude of the electric field in the pupil plane. And the relation yeah, is merely a Fourier transform yeah, given by that expression. So we see here yeah, where what Fourier transform does really look like. And 
Well, this is true, yeah, provided that we made a change of variables, yeah, so the coordinates x prime and y prime <coughs> in the focal plane, yeah, well, are related, yeah, to p and q by those relations. Then we, 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 we made several applications, yeah, of that uh, important theorem. Well, okay, this is, uh, so the, the, f the f fundamental theorem, I, I just told it, the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane is given by the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the intrans pupil plane. Yeah? Okay, then we, we, we applied that theorem yeah, to two special cases. The first case was a telescope yeah, made of a square pupil with a side you see being small a, so the side of the square. And if we apply that theorem, yeah, we may derive yeah, what is the expression of the complex amplitude in the focal plane or of the intensity, yeah, which is the square modulus of that amplitude. And we found that, wow, it's something which looks like a disk, yeah, but with a square geometry. Then we saw that this was defining the angular resolution yeah, of the telescope yeah, made of a square pupil. And the angular resolution yeah, is given by that width, which is 2 lambda over A, where A yeah, is a measure of the side of the square. After we did something more difficult, yeah, we considered an aperture for the pupil of the telescope, which is circular. Oops. Sorry. No. I have to come back one more here. So let's assume yeah, that the pupil now is uh, circular. We got the expression of the intensity of the focal plane. Well, finding the expression of the airy disk yeah, that uh, yeah, we saw with our little experiment previously. And uh, this is quite interesting. So I may write here yeah, that the distribution of the amplitude in the focal plane, which normally should be PQ, but because of the symmetry, yeah, we just adopted yeah, polar coordinates. So we say, well, this is also equal to A. It's X prime over lambda F, Y prime over lambda F. But because of the symmetry, this could be replaced by rho prime times cos theta prime over lambda f. And here rho prime sine theta prime over lambda f. And finally, we saw that it was not dependent on theta prime. So at the end, yeah, the distribution of the amplitude in the focal plane yeah, is just a quantity of rho prime over lambda f. Yeah, so it doesn't depend on theta prime which is equal to, so this is intensity, so I should take the square root of that, yeah? So I find that it is pi times the square of the radius. Okay, then times two times j1, I would say of a parameter z that I will define in a moment, divided by z where z, the quantity z, is equal to 2 pi r time rho prime over lambda f, like this. And that's all. So uh, I have assumed here yeah, that there is no obstruction by a secondary, so that it is a fully sealed circular aperture. And this is expression that we derived yeah, for the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane. So we see that there is here yeah, the first order yeah, uh, Bessel function, which gets to zero when z is equal to 3.9. Yeah? And uh, the reason why yeah, I just brought those results is because now we are going to make uh, an interesting exercise. 
which is the following. So, well, did someone, did, did someone find uh, the answer to the problem, Leo? What is this expression for the case of the square aperture? Yeah. No, no, no one had time to look at that problem. No, because we said well, probably there is no analytical result. But yeah, maybe you, you found the solution. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, just keep it in mind. Yeah, it's an interesting problem. So we'll come back to that later. But now, look. The problem I would like you to solve now. Yeah. So everybody should try to to solve that problem. Well, we found that the visibility, yeah? so the visibility of the fringes, is equal yeah, to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence, which is equal to, you remember, the Fourier transform yeah, of the normalized intensity at yeah, the surface of the source. Yeah? And so here I can say, well, it is a function of the frequency uv, yeah? where u uh, is equal to x over lambda, v is equal to y over lambda. Now, le let's assume yeah, that we are observing here a star, yeah? a star which is circular. So you see, circular like that. And the angular radius, yeah, uh, or I could say no, no, yeah, yeah, I would say the angular radius of that star is rho, yeah. So the angular diameter, that I would call theta, yeah, is equal to twice this angular radius. And I would like to know what is the expression of the visibility. Now I don't know if you see the parallelism between that problem there, yeah, where we said, okay. Uh, the distribution of the complex amplitude yeah, in the focal plane yeah, is equal to the Fourier transform yeah, of the pupil function yeah, Pxy, like this. Well, here instead of Pq, I, I saw that well, it depend, depended on, only on rho prime over lambda f. And here is the pupil. We assume that it was circular and that the radius of the pupil yeah, was big R, okay? So you see the parallelism between the two problems, yeah? Well, we, we shall not make a new demonstration. What we would like yeah, is just to get advantage yeah, of that demonstration made last time, yeah? To find, well, what should be the expression of the visibility? So, what I would propose now, during five minutes, yeah, that you try on a sheet of paper to find yeah, what, what is the solution to that problem. It's uh, I of zeta theta divided by This is a definition of I prime, yeah? This quantity, yeah, I assume to be a constant, yeah? So, if it is a constant, yeah, this is just equal to 1 over d zeta d eta. You agree? And now, can someone tell me what will be that value? Well, there is a pi, but there is something else. No. Almost. Square. Square, yeah. Well, do we agree that pi rho square, yeah, is a solid angle, yeah, over which I see the stars, if its radius is rho, yeah? So the surface, if this is rho, yeah, well, the angular radius is pi rho square, yeah? So this is expression of the normalized, yeah, intensity, yeah? So this is already something. 
And now, do we agree eh, that this quantity has to be set in parallel yeah, with this quantity? Yeah? Which means that when I, I find the expression yeah, of uh, the visibility, so the visibility yeah, is a function of x over lambda, y over lambda. Now, well, which correspondence I should find, for instance, for x over lambda, y over lambda? Do you agree that, well, it is this? Yeah? These are yeah, two kind of uh, quantities which are related yeah, when I make a transposition. So, I write here, it's equal to, first, I write this one. Well, do, do we agree that the row here, the row, yeah, the row here, is to be, yeah, is to be set, yeah, the same level as R, yeah? So, the answer will be first pi row square, yeah? So this is um, here. Then, of course, yeah, I should find yeah, I prime is given by that value. And here, this was given by 1. So here, it is as if you have multiplied by 1, in fact, yeah? So what I do? I take this one, so I divide by pi rho square. Yeah. The next, I have to multiply by the remaining quantity, which is twice g1. And here, well, I may just uh, write as a function of w, where w will be, will be equal to what? Well, w yeah, is equivalent of z. Yeah. So it will be 2 pi rho, yeah? This seems okay. 2 pi rho. Then rho prime, yeah? Rho prime. This is a polar coordinate, yeah? So what, what, what is rho prime here? Do you think, what, what, what is it equivalent to, rho prime? To what? Delta. No. So the row prime there, yeah, would have to be in correspondence with what? Do we agree that row prime here, yeah, is something like the square root of x prime square plus y prime square, yeah? So here, it should be. It should be, yeah, the square root yeah, of x square plus y square, yeah, which is nothing else than the baseline, yeah. So this is the baseline, the separation between the two telescopes. Okay. After I have to divide. Well, I see here that I had x over lambda, and there is no f, yeah. There is no f, yeah. So here I should divide not by lambda f, but by lambda. So I divide by lambda. And now I find that well, at, at the end, it's pi. Twice the radius is the angular diameter, yeah? So this is theta. B is the baseline. And lambda is the wavelength. And so, well, the, I have this simplification, yeah? And I find that the visibility expression, yeah? is simply twice the Bessel function divided by W, where W is given by that expression. Yeah. So you see how to make the correspondences. Yeah? It's very simple, yeah? very logical. Yeah? But uh, one has to think it, about it a, a little bit. Yeah? So you see here, visibility yeah, is just equal to that, exactly what we have derived now. And this shows you yeah, when you are observing a star, 
with a, an interferometer. If the two telescopes are very near to each other, you look at the star, you don't resolve it. Yeah? It looks like a pond-like star. Yeah? So visibility is very high. It gets to, what, to one. After you separate the telescopes, and then you see, whoa, the fringes yeah, lose some contrast. Yeah? And if you observe even more, farther away, by separating the two telescopes, the visibility still decreases. And it will get to zero here, yeah, when this quantity will be equal to 3.9. Yeah, 3.9. So when this will be equal to 3.9, where the visibility will be, will be null, and this will happen yeah, for theta equal lambda over b times 3.9 divided by 3.14. Yeah? And this is 1.22. You see? So this is what people do. Yeah? They are just making a series of observations with different baselines. And after, they just make a fit yeah, of that function over the data points they get. And they find the angular, the angular diameter of the star in regions. Yeah? It, this is in regions. So any question about that? Bikram, I see you very doubtful, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> But it is very instructive, yeah, because uh, you get immediately the, the result, yeah. Also, I so you would have to make the demonstration, yeah, which would take one hour, yeah. We did that last time, yeah. It was taking a lot of time, yeah. yeah. So, do, do you have any doubt or question? Uh, if, if it is uh, not a quantity source, uh, then it is a extended source, then. Uh, we have to take up account of its intensity distribution, is it? Yeah. To, to derive the visibility? Yeah. So, well, well, so first, yeah, this is what uh, most of astronomers do. Yeah? They assume that it is uniformly bright, the star. Yeah? And then the second assumption yeah, is to assume that there is a limb darkening effect. Yeah? It means that the star is brighter just like the sun. Yeah? in the center than at the edge. Well, this, this will add maybe two more parameters. Yeah? So instead of deriving a single parameter in that case, yeah, you will derive three parameters at the same time by just fitting the observed points. But of course, I mean, the analytic, analytical expression yeah, will involve yeah, those two parameters, two more parameters. Yeah? But it, it works. Yeah? And you find also that most of the stars show limb darkening effect, that they are brighter in the center and gets yeah, much, much uh, fainter at the edge. Now, la last time I asked an exercise, which was the following. I just say, well, when we are observing yeah, with a square aperture, we found that the angular resolution, so I would say theta resolution, yeah, was equal to 2 lambda over A, where A was the size of the square. Yeah? And then we saw for a circular aperture that the angular resolution was, in fact, 2, 44 lambda over D. You agree? Where D was the diameter. Yeah? Of the, of the circular mirror. And I ask you, well, let's assume yeah, that the area of the square is the same as that yeah, of the circular mirror. Yeah? Which one would you prefer in terms of angular resolution? Yeah? And well, <coughs> Some of you said, well, we, I take the circular one. 
But the problem here yeah, with circular one, well, with a square one, is that you get this angular resolution along that direction and along that direction, yeah? Now, along this direction, yeah? Does it get better or worse? It gets even better. Better, better. yeah? Absolutely, yeah. So, well, in any case, yeah, what I found is that this angular resolution yeah, would be equivalent to 2.16 lambda over A, assuming that the two areas were the same. Yeah? So, indeed, yeah, we find that this one leads to a worse resolution on average. Yeah? So, this is better. So, why do we use uh, a because it's easier to manufacture. Because you know, the polishing of a mirror yeah, takes advantage of circular motion. So in order to make a square one, you would need first to make a circular one, and then to cut the edge. This would be a, a loss of time and of efforts and of everything, yeah? Yeah, this is the reason, yeah? It's, well, circularity is a, something nice. And now we, we come to a very interesting problem here. Yeah? The idea is that we, now we are going to use a, not a, a screen yeah, with two pinholes like in the Young's experiment, but we will assume now that the holes are of finite size, yeah? so that they are, can be represented by the mirrors of a telescope. Yeah? So this is exactly a, Two telescopes, yeah, with a two circular aperture, and uh, where well, you see that the parallel beam of light rays gets reflected here. Then, with a mirror at 45 degrees, yeah, it goes uh, outside the tube of the tube. Here it goes somewhere. It's uh, called a coup de focus, yeah. <coughs> the same on the other side. Then we have to, in, to, to involve delay lines yeah, to make sure that the length of the two light paths is the same. And we, we just let the beams inter, interfere in. Yeah? So let's assume for, for simplicity that we are observing a star at zenith, yeah? in that the two circular apertures may be represented yeah, by this diagram. So now the, the, the question is the following. Well, what? will be the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane. Mm -hmm. And once we know what is the distribution of the complex amplitude, we may find the expression of the intensity. What sort of intensity distribution yeah, do we observe in the focal plane when we combine yeah, the light rays, quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, coming from two telescopes? Yeah? Well, we know fundamental theorem the distribution of the complex amplitude in the vocal plane is a Fourier transform of the, of the distribution of complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah? So, very simple to do. Well, <coughs> now, well in, the, well, in the lecture notes, yeah, well, we have considered that the two telescope have square apertures because, well, in principle, it's more simple, but in fact, it's not, it's not even necessary we may assume that the two apertures yeah, are anything, it could be triangular, it could be circular, it could be square. Yeah? You will see the answer is exactly the same. Yeah? So we shall do that now. This is the next step. Fundamental theory, yeah? the distribution of the complex amplitude in Yeah, in the focal plane is equal to the Fourier transform yeah, of <coughs> the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane. Yeah? So we have to write down yeah, the expression of the pupil function. And I assume yeah, that the pupil function yeah, is composed of uh, two apertures, which are similar. And they are just yeah, separated by a baseline D, big D, along the x-axis. 
Yeah? So do, do we agree that if I represent here yeah, the pupil function of a single aperture by P0, that this one is given by x plus d divided by one half y plus P0 x minus d divided by 2 y. Yeah? So long y, yeah? So there is nothing, of course, it's the same. But along x, one is centered at minus d half and the other one at plus d half. Yeah? Okay, now, <coughs> if I take the Fourier transform yeah, of uh, the summation, you have two element, elementary pupils, it's equal to the summation of the two Fourier transform. Yeah? So I find that APQ is equal to the Fourier transform of P0 x plus d over 2 y plus the Fourier transform of P0 x minus d over 2 y. Now I should like to remind you a result that we established yeah, some time ago, which is the following. The Fourier transform of a function f, which depends on x minus a, like that, yeah, is equal to the Fourier transform yeah, of the function x multiplied by e minus 2 pi a p. Yeah? So I apply this property here and I find that it's equal to e i pi dp because twice d over 2, yeah, the 2 goes away. Now plus e minus i p p d like this, multiplied by the Fourier transform of P0 of xy, which depends of PQ. Yeah? Now this, yeah, I find that this is simply twice the cosine of pi times p d. Yeah. And now here, yeah, I could give you an expression of that pupil if it is square. So this is what we have done last time, yeah. We found that it was equal to d square times the sine of p pi small d divided by pi p d times the sine of pi q d divided by pi q d. So this is what we, we established yeah, during the previous lecture if the pupil has a square shape which has a side of measuring d. Yeah. We may retrieve the distribution of intensity in the focal plane, which is equal again to the square of the value of the modulus. Yeah. And we find that it is equal to so I just have to multiply, so it would be 4 times d to the power of 4 times sine square and multiply, yeah, still by cos square of pi pd. Yeah.
Okay, now I will show you yeah, with um, the color. We see here, yeah, something like that, which is given by this expression, in fact, yeah. Yeah, so it's a low frequency variation of the on spread function, yeah, of the intensity distribution. So, the, <coughs> and now, along the p-axis, yeah, it's being modulated, yeah, by this. You see? So, we, well, we, we could try to see, yeah, for which value this function gets to zero, yeah? So it's easy. It will get to zero when pi pd is equal to pi, yeah? Plus or minus, yeah, of course, yeah. So it will get to zero when pi is equal to plus or minus one over d. And here I see, indeed, yeah? Uh, this is plus one over d, so I see that the function gets to zero here and it gets to zero for the value of minus one over d, yeah? Now, when will this one yeah, get to zero, yeah? <coughs> it will get to zero when pi p big D is equal to pi over two. Well, plus or minus, of course, yeah? So it will, this will happen for p equal plus or minus 1 over 2d. Yeah? And indeed, I see that here for the value 1 over 2 big D, it gets to 0. And for minus 1 over 2 to big D, it gets to 0 too. Yeah? So in fact, yeah, this will uh, determine yeah, the angular resolution of our interferometer. Yeah? Because, uh, well, the angular resolution is given yeah, by the smallest scale with which you will be able to see details in the object. Yeah? So this is one. Yeah? Now, uh, as a reminder, yeah, the definition of P it was equal to x prime divided by lambda f. Yeah? So I find that, OK, pi, uh, P, so x prime over lambda f is equal to plus or minus 1 over 2d. So now I multiply the left side and the right side by lambda. I obtain this. And from this I get that the width of the peak divided by the focal length is equal to the plus value minus the negative value, yeah? So it will be lambda over d. Now, who can tell me what represents delta x prime over f? Minima. Yeah. So this represents, we do agree, this represents yeah, the angular width yeah, of the central peak. So between the two minima. So it defines angular resolution of the interferometer. And we see that it's given by a very simple expression, which is lambda over big D, where D is a separation between the two telescopes. Yeah? So we see that, you know, well, an interferometer composed of two telescopes, yeah, is an angular resolution which is defined by the baseline. So if you succeed in putting two telescopes, yeah, one kilometer away, well, it will give you an angular resolution equivalent to that of a single dish, which diameter would be one kilometer in size, yeah? Along that direction, of course, only along that direction. Now, you, you see that the angular resolution of the interferometer yeah, is essentially determined by this quantity, yeah, this one. 
And this one I see, well, it's independent yeah, on the nature of the pupil that we are using for our individual telescope. Yeah? It can be square, square telescopes, circular telescopes, or triangular telescopes. Yeah? Well, I would always yeah, recover this angular resolution with an interferometer. Yeah? So it doesn't depend on the shape of the unit telescopes. Where well, there is a demonstration, yeah? So with this result, the result here. Now, still uh, a few slides, and after I think we can make a small interruption. So what, what uh, is represented here, yeah, are the two telescopes, yeah, looking at a very distant star. and. Uh, this is for the VLTI, and it shows you yeah, the number of reflections yeah, that the light rays undergo before be recombined in the focus room. So you see one reflection, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah, it's impressive, yeah, and every time you are losing, yeah, some of the light, so uh, at the end, uh, it's very inefficient, so, well, an interferometer like the VLTI is uh, really very good, yeah, for bright objects, to absorb bright objects, because then you have the angular resolution, and then you have some sensitivity, yeah, and now, as I explained last time, we should make sure that the length of the two yellow light rays is the same. But what we see is that here it goes uh, that distance will farther away compared to that one. So we have to compensate for that. Yeah? And this is where the role of the delay lines yeah, come into play. We see that here we have two mirrors which can be moved yeah, along uh, rails and compensate yeah, for the difference in path lengths. Yeah? Just as a reminder, I showed them last time, but if you go uh, below the telescopes yeah, in the well, delay line room, you see these rails. And uh, this is a uh, system of uh, multiple mirrors which is moving back and forth yeah, during the time that you know the telescope observes the star and then of course uh, the pass length is varying as a function of time yeah so <coughs> these uh, carriages are moving at a quite fast speed with a precision which is better than uh, one micron at all times because you must make sure that the difference between the two light pass, yeah, is smaller than typically one, two microns. So this is a zoom, yeah, and this uh, small train <laughs> which is rolling over the rails, yeah. So this is a convolution of two functions, f and j, yeah. You see, it's just the integration of the function evaluated here for the argument x minus t times j of t. Well, below we've shown uh, two examples for such a function. So this is a well door function where the argument here is x over a. Yeah? So it is 0 if you are below minus a over 2 or 0 when you are above, yeah, a over 2. And uh, the other one is a function, rectangle function, x with an argument x over b. And now, if we convolve the two, what we do, well, we, we choose yeah, a value of x, yeah? Then we translate this function with respect to the other one. It's what is down here. We see what is the intersection of the two, because these are door functions, yeah? And then, well, we just uh, construct this graph, yeah, which gives you this area, the result, as a function of x. Yeah? And what we see is that, of course, at the beginning, yeah, there is no overlap. 
when it gets to closer, yeah, well, the overlap begins. So it reaches maximum when this window enters the other one. So we are here. Then it remains in sight until well, it goes away again yeah, and we get that graph. Yeah? So this is just a convolution. Yeah? Now, why do I introduce this uh, convolution? It's because we are going to use it as follows. Yeah? So le let's assume yeah, that we have a converging system. This is a P, P axis, yeah? P. And let's assume that I observe a very distant star, yeah? So I may represent, yeah, the distant star by the direct function, delta P, yeah? So it's, uh, of course, infinity, yeah, when, uh, when uh, it's located at P equals zero, yeah, and uh, zero otherwise, yeah? But what I know yeah, by, well, by experience, when I'm looking at a star, well, I observe yeah, exactly centered on p equals zero, yeah, the response function, yeah, which is known as the point spread function yeah, of the instrument. Yeah? So <clears throat> what I observe here in one dimension yeah, is hp square, because this is the intensity. Yeah? So I have we present it here, yeah? the intensity as a function of p. And this is, of course, yeah. Now, at zero, yeah, when p is equal to zero, well, I should put zero here, and I, I observe the maximum, yeah? yeah? Which is here. Now, if I move away, yeah, my star, if I put the star here for a value uh, p minus r, okay? Well, of course, I mean, it's being translated into focal plane, yeah? it's what we have seen, yeah? And it will be centered at value p equal r. So what I see here, yeah, is a point spread function which is merely translated, yeah? Now let's assume that I'm not observing a star, but an extended object, yeah? And, uh, well, the representation of that object yeah, is O. So I just say P minus R, but it's an extended object, yeah? So what I observe Let me say, okay, it is centered yeah, at R, like that, yeah? And I'm, I, I, I'm wondering, yeah, well, if I, okay, if I make the value R, yeah, so the object is here, of course, yeah? But what is the value observed at the value P, yeah? Well, it's simply OR multiplied by the value of HP minus R square. Do you agree with that? Because, well, so the object yeah, is at R, centered here, and I'm inter interested in knowing yeah, what is the contribution at the value R, but for at, at P, exactly. So. Here you may think that, well, I have uh, the point spread function going like that, yeah? And I say, well, the contribution, yeah, of this extended source there is simply OR multiplied, yeah, by the value, yeah, of the point spread function, yeah, which is offset, yeah? So evaluated for the value P minus R. And now if I'm wondering, well, but what is the whole contribution, yeah, of this object which may uh, cover a big area in the sky? I just say, well, it's simply the integration of OR times the module of HP minus R square dr, yeah? 
and I find that, oh, this is simply the convolution product yeah, of OP by the point spread function. Okay? Now, what I've done in one dimension, yeah, I can, I can generalize with two dimensions because we are, we have, a, well, angular coordinates on the plane of the sky. So I say, okay, now what is the value of the function for the focal plane uh, variable p and q due to an extended object? Well, it's just a convolution product of the two, just like here. So this is, yeah. <clears throat> the result, yeah? So I have the distribution of brightness in the focal plane due to an extended object, yeah? Is a convolution product of its real distribution convolved by the on spread function. Now, Let's assume, yeah, that OPQ, okay, and I use the same in one dimension, huh? yeah. Let, let's assume that the extended object is not extended at all, but it's due to a pond-like star, yeah, which is uh, located at P equals zero, Q equals zero. So I can say, well, the star has a total brightness E, time, the direct function, delta PQ, now you just insert this here inside, and when you, you convolve this direct function with that, what you find? You find that EPQ is simply equal to E times the point spread function. Yeah? So you recover the point spread function because it's due to a, a point like star. Yeah? This is trivial. Now, what is uh, more interesting when you see that, you say, well, if you would take yeah, the Fourier transform yeah, of the two, of the two, two members, yeah, what should we find? Well, we would find that the Fourier transform of this energy distribution is equal to the Fourier transform. Well, it will be the product, yeah, simple product of the two Fourier transform of OPQ. Multiply, yeah, here, by the Fourier transform of HPQ square. Now from this, yeah, what I can infer is that, oh, the real distribution due to the flux of the object, yeah, is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of this Fourier transform that I observed, divided by the Fourier transform of the on spread function. Agree? So what I did, yeah? I keep that, I divide this by that, and to recover this one, I have to take the inverse Fourier transform, yeah? And so, well, here, yeah, appears something quite interesting. It seems that, well, you may retrieve the real distribution of intensity of an extended object, yeah? If you know what is observed, what is its observed distribution of intensity of the focal plane, yeah? And if you know, yeah, what is the Fourier transform of the Ponsprat function, yeah? So when you look at that, you say, wow, it's miraculous, yeah? Well, maybe with a five centimeter telescope, yeah? And I observe uh, Andromeda, yeah? I know that the, the free transfer, well, the transfer function of a five centimeter telescope, yeah, will be something awful, yeah, very bad. But it seems that I may retrieve, yeah, the real distribution of Andromeda, yeah? By dividing its observed intensity in the focal plane with a five centimeter telescope, correcting for that, yeah? And this is yeah, theoretically yeah, possible, but in practice it's not possible. Why? It's because when I look yeah, at uh, 
this Fourier transform yeah, as a function of a spatial frequency, yeah, I see that it will give me some value for some special frequency, but for very high special frequency, yeah, the signal will be zero because there is no signal there. Yeah? And that I will show you later yeah, with a demonstration, which is the Wiener, the Wiener theorem, which shows that this quantity I have uh, circled this yeah, is simply equal to the autocorrelation function of the pupil of your telescope yeah, or of your interferometer. Yeah. So we will demonstrate that this is simply equal yeah, to integration of the pupil function xy x minus p y minus q dx dy. So you see, well, this is a very simple expression to, to calculate because, well, you know what is your pupil function, yeah? And you just, uh, in fact, uh, evaluate what is the autocorrelation function of your pupil, and it's exactly equal to that, yeah? And now we know what, when we make an autocorrelation function, yeah? Okay, uh, here I will get signal, yeah? If the two have some overlap, yeah? But if there is no overlap, it will be zero, yeah? And this is a problem, is that this is uh, fantastic, but it's not defined for all the space frequencies, yeah? And therefore, it's not possible with a five centimeter telescope, yeah? To recover, yeah? Extreme details on Andromeda, yeah? Because there is a cut, yeah? In special frequencies. But we will see that, yeah? A little bit later. But this is a deconvolution theorem, yeah? But at least it tells you yeah, that when you have an image and you correct it yeah, for the point spread function degradation, yeah, convolution, well, you may retrieve a better image yeah, of the source you are observing. So you may improve its quality. Uh, and so we suppose here that there is no atmosphere or... Um, well, it even works if there is atmosphere because the atmospheric effect will be present in that and function. So H will not be constant with time? Or, uh, with, because I, I, I'm thinking of the seeing, which changes the yeah. shape of... Now, l l let's assume yeah, that you're observing a galaxy, yeah? and very close to it, you have a star. Yeah? So wh what you would do, you're interested in the galaxy. Yeah? So this is where it comes in. Yeah, This is... a. Uh, flux from the galaxy. And to get this one, you will take the Fourier transform of this intensity. You agree? And because they're observing at the same time, all together, you may find um, many more details yeah, from the galaxy image than would be possible otherwise. But if there is no star close to it, yeah, then you are in trouble. Because you would take uh, this picture maybe during one hour, and after one hour, you would take uh, another image of a nearby star. But as you say, maybe the atmospheric conditions have changed. And so, well, this is not good anymore, yeah? Yeah. But if, if by chance, yeah, you have a, a nearby object, then it will work, yeah? So convolution and deconvolution, yeah? I propose an interesting application of that theorem, yeah? which is the following. The reminder, yeah, the convolution of two functions, yeah, is equal to integration of f x minus t times j t dt. And it is also equal, yeah, to f x J x minus t dt. Okay? So you can make a change of variables, yeah? Say y equal x minus t. You make the change of variable and you will recover this result, yeah? The two representations, yeah, are similar. But the problem 
that we are interested in here yeah, is that we, we are observing in the sky a star which is square and its angular radius here yeah, is phi so phi and phi like that and uh, we are observing it yeah, with uh, an interferometer made of two telescopes separated by the baseline D and the size of one square is small d. Now we know if the star yeah, is point-like, yeah, we have uh, established previously yeah, the expression of the response function, yeah, which was, you remember, sine square of x over x square times cosine of 2 times p, 2 pi pd, and so on. Yeah? But now, I assume that the, the object is not point-like, but is extended. Yeah? And its angular size is phi. And what we are wondering is uh, what is the uh, expression of the intensity distribution in the focal plane? Yeah? <coughs> so first thing we need to know to, to establish is that what is a function which will represent the square star, yeah? the star which is a square, yeah? with an angular size of phi by phi. Yeah? So do you agree that, well, I also state that the integrated intensity of that star, yeah? when I integrate intensity, it's equal to E. So a big E like that, yeah? This is the integrated intensity. So I could say, OK, OPQ should be equal to a constant yeah? times two door functions. Yeah? And the argument yeah, of the door functions yeah, must involve P and Q. So what I know yeah, is that uh, in terms yeah, of the coordinates defined in the focal plane, well, this uh, should be something like that, x prime divided by f. This is the uh, angular extent of the star, and then divided by phi hmm? times phi y prime over f times phi. Why? Because I see that this is equal to 1 if x prime over f phi is smaller than one half or bigger than minus one half, yeah? Which means that x prime over f is smaller or equal to phi over two or bigger than minus phi over two. And this is exactly what I want, yeah? I want that in the focal plane, yeah, I will see the star, yeah? And any feature of the star, yeah, which is uh, at coordinate x prime, yeah, should be inside, yeah, the angular radius phi, yeah. So x prime over f should be smaller than that and bigger than that, yeah. And it translates like what I've written here, yeah. So is everybody convinced by this representation? Yeah. Okay, but now I know that. The coordinate p is equal to x prime over lambda f, yeah? So if I see here x prime over f, from here I find that x prime over f is equal to lambda p, yeah? This is the definition of p, yeah? of x prime over lambda f. From that I find that x prime over f equal lambda p. And so I find here that I replace x prime 2f by lambda p. So here it should be lambda p over phi, lambda q, oh, and here, oh, sorry, and here, lambda q over phi. Do we agree that this is a representation yeah, of the intensity distribution of a square star? as a function of lambda uh, of p and q. 
So I just erase that. What I know is that when I integrate yeah, the intensity of that star over the coordinates PQ, it should be this should be equal to E. This is the assumption, yeah? So let's integrate this and let's make a change of variable. Uh, so I could state that lambda p over phi is equal to x and lambda q over phi is equal to y. Now I find that dp will be equal to phi over lambda times dx and I find that dq will be equal to y uh, to phi times dy over lambda. So I find that this is also equal to the constant <coughs> times double integration times the door function. Lambda p over phi, it is x. Okay. Times the door function of lambda q over phi, this is y. Now times dp dq. The dp dq will be dx dy like this, times phi over lambda square. And all of that is equal to, oh, yeah, and all of that is equal to big E. Yeah? So I make from that, who can tell, tell me what's the value of this double integration? Double integration of the door function over dx dy. Come here. This one. So if you integrate yeah, the door function here, yeah, from minus half to plus one half, and its average value is one, so it's so it's one. So this is one times one, in fact, yeah. So it's one. So we find that the constant, yeah, it's E. So here I may replace yeah, the constant by E. times lambda over phi square. Yeah, like that. So now it's normalized, yeah? Now, do we agree that well, what is most interesting to us, yeah, is not the elongation of the star along Q, but along P. So I could write that, okay, OPQ well, could be uh, represented as a the, the, the product of OP times OQ, yeah? defining OP as the square root of what I found here. Yeah? So it will be the square root of E times lambda over phi times the door function of lambda p over phi. Yeah? So you see here, I say, OK, my square star can be represented as a double product of two function, which are exactly the same. Yeah? And, uh, the one of interest to us is of O of P, which is, of course, the square root of what I had there. Yeah? So square root of E times lambda over phi times pi lambda pi over phi. OK? Now, what, what I'm interested in is to find what is the distribution of uh, the complex amplitude in the focal plane, yeah? EP. And this I know, yeah? This is a convolution product of OP 
by the square of the response function along the p direction. Yeah? So here I should say convolution product, yeah. So I should write it now well, what what it will be. So HP yeah, in a similar way yeah, could could be represented here yeah, by uh, HP square by the square root of that, yeah, but taking keeping the information along uh, the direction of the P. So I would say well it's two times D at the power two times, of course, sine square of pi pd over pi pd square times the cos square so times uh, the cos square of pi pd. Okay? And so now, well, I just need to make yeah, this uh, convolution where OP is given by this expression and where HP square is given by that other expression. Now we may just uh, look at the slide if I made any mistake. Okay. Okay, so EP is equal to the root of E, this comes from here. So, 2 d square times the square root of E times lambda over phi. And now if to to make the convolution product here. Yeah? So I say, okay, now I have to integrate. But you see, the <coughs> I should write, yeah, inside, yeah, I, I will make it, yeah, from minus infinity to infinity, yeah. So here I could say, this is lambda p minus r over phi times, so I got this one now, and now it remains, it remains to insert these two, times the sine square of pi, now it's r, yeah, of course, rd, divided by pi rd square, No, it's r. Yeah, because I, well, <coughs> I just make p minus r, and now here I integrate on the r variable. Huh? Yeah. And now I forgot this one. No. Cos square of pi r d, exact. And now dr. Yeah. Okay. Since this is a door function, yeah. I may uh, remove it, yeah, and instead of setting minus infinity to plus infinity, to change, yeah, the limits of integration, yeah. So I may write that lambda times p minus r over phi must be smaller or equal to one half and bigger or equal to minus one half, yeah. Now I will change. Uh, the sign, yeah, and I can say that one half, yeah, should be bigger or equal to lambda times r minus p over phi, and here be bigger or equal to minus one half, like that. Now what I do, I multiply yeah, by phi, I divide by lambda, all those terms, and then the plus p I put on both sides. So. I find that R must be bigger or equal to 
phi over lambda divided by 2. Here it will be, well, with minus, of course. Here it will be phi divided by 2 lambda plus. And then finally, here I can put p, and here p. Correct? Okay, now, here, if this is correct, yeah? so I should go yeah? from p minus phi over 2 lambda, and here to p plus phi over 2 lambda. Okay? And what I do, I just remove this, yeah? Just remove this. Okay? And uh, we refine the same result as here, yeah? You see? I assume that a single pupil telescope, yeah, cannot resolve my star. Okay? So, you agree yeah, that I'm using now an interferometer made of a, yeah, this is an interferometer here. And what I assume is that a single pupil cannot resolve the star. Because if it would resolve the star, it would need an interferometer to resolve it. Yeah, yeah. So this assumption yeah, can be written like this. Yeah? I can say, OK, uh, the angular diameter of the star, phi, must be much smaller yeah, than lambda over small d, where d yeah, is the size of the square mirror. This is angular resolution. Yeah? Yeah? So if this is much, much smaller, I cannot resolve it. Correct? OK. So now, first of all, here it's not a small d. Yeah? This is a big D. I'm just interested yeah, in seeing yeah, uh, the quantity pi R D between which limit it will vary. Yeah? So it will be it will vary between the limits pi plus phi over two lambda like that multiplied by <coughs> Pi D. Hmm? You agree? And here it will be the inverse. Eh? It will be P minus phi over 2 lambda multiplied by pi D. Okay? Now let's distribute, yeah? So here I would find that it's P pi D minus pi half times phi D over lambda. And here it will be P pi D plus phi over 2 times phi D over lambda. Okay, now, here what I find is that phi times d over lambda is much more, so it's much smaller than 1. Huh? You agree? Multiplied by d, I divide by lambda. So if it is really much, much smaller than 1, I could say, okay, this is equal to epsilon, yeah? Epsilon, yeah? <coughs> Tending to infinity, uh, to, to 0, yeah? So I, I, I find that this quantity here, yeah, is an epsilon. And this quantity here is also an epsilon, yeah? Which means that this argument, yeah, yeah? Well, doesn't vary much in that range because it just remains around this value, yeah? Because, well, this is negligible, yeah? Okay? So what I can do, since it doesn't vary very much inside the integra integration side, I may take it outside. Okay? Yeah? So this one, <coughs> I may just take outside. And by which value should I replace the R? Of 
say this is negligible, this is negligible, yeah? I just replace the R by P, yeah? yeah. So this becomes sine square of pi PD divided by the square of pi PD. Okay, so this is a simplification. Now I could uh, again yeah, say, okay, let's assume now that the interferometer yeah, cannot resolve my star, yeah, okay, that it lacks some angular resolution to resolve it. Yeah? Well, I could do exactly the same. Instead of putting here small d, I would say, okay, if my interferometer cannot resolve the star, it's because its angular diameter it's much smaller than that angular resolution, yeah? And if this was true, what, what I would do, yeah? Well, I could take this one outside the integra in integration, yeah? And replace R by P. But it is not the case. If I'm using the interferometer, it's because this condition is not true anymore, yeah? It's not true anymore. Well, D is a baseline between the two, two optical telescopes. No, no you, you could repeat the same reasoning as what I did now, and you would just say, well, what I can do is just take it away, the integration sign, and replace here the small r by p. Yeah, that, that's the result. And if you would do that, what you would find, whoa, I find, in fact, that the distribution of the, of the brightness, yeah, is just that expression, just that expression, yeah, yeah. It's because I'm not resolving my star, yeah? But here, I assume that I'm resolving it, okay? And this is not correct, okay. So, now I make another assumption. So, if uh, the two telescopes are too near, yeah? I don't resolve it, and then I may take this outside integration sign and replace the R by P. Now, let's assume, this is interesting, that phi is equal to lambda over d. So it means that, wow, I'm just now starting resolving the, the star, yeah? So what will happen to that integration, yeah? So we will see. Uh, what should I do? So, yeah. So do you agree that phi over lambda is equal to 1 over d, correct, huh? yeah? And phi over 2 lambda is equal to 1 over 2d. So this integration, yeah, becomes the following. It will be the integration of p minus that one, 1 over 2d, and here it's p plus 1 over 2d. Yeah, if I didn't make a mistake, yeah? And then I have a cos square pi rd dr. So let's make the change of variable, y equal pi rd. So we have a dr will be equal to dy over pi d. And this will become integration from, so I have to multiply this one by, so it will be pi pd, yeah, minus uh, pi half, correct? In here, I will have p pi pd plus half pi. Now I have cos square of prd, which is y, dr dy over pi d. Now, could someone tell me, yeah? If this integration, look at the limit, does it still depend on P or not? So 
So this is a periodic function. So I show it here, yeah. So this would be y. So zero it's one. When I get half pi it's zero. Then it goes up, goes down, goes down, like that, yeah. So this is a function, yeah. Now look, I'm integrating it, yeah, from for instance p pi d, let's assume it is here, yeah. Minus one half, yeah. Uh, so I would come here from this value to this value plus a half pi, yeah? and half pi is that. So it would be, I'm trying to correct some, somewhere here, somewhere here, yeah. So I would integrate as yes, a function, you see, from there to there. Do you agree that if I, if I chose on the point P somewhere else, it would be exactly the same? Yeah? So it doesn't depend on P. It means that you don't see any more interference. So it means the visibility of the fringes is zero. Yeah? So you see what, what, what we have shown yeah? is that if the angular resolution well, or if the baseline yeah, <coughs> responds to this relation, so the angular diameter is lambda over D, where D is the baseline, yeah, well, we see that you are losing yeah, the fringes. Yeah? It's because we have resolved the star. Yeah? And as long as uh, this condition is not satisfied, yeah, well, then, of course, well, here I could say that any time yeah, I would have this condition for k equal 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, well, the visibility will be 0. Yeah? Otherwise, there will be some information, yeah? And I will see fringes, yeah? In particular, especially that if uh, phi is much smaller than lambda over d, well, then this goes away, yeah? From the integration side, the r becomes a p. This goes away, yeah? And I find that, oh, this is exactly what I had at the beginning. Yeah, because the square star appears as a point-like star to the interferometer, yeah? But if the condition is satisfied, then, whoa, I don't see any more fringes. This, this has gone away, yeah? But I reserve this for next time, yeah? Because, well, it's a long, you, you have to absorb, yeah, what I, I've shown you, I've shown to you, and uh, digest it, yeah? And then be ready to accept another one, yeah? Well, here, the, the next demonstration yeah, will be the following. Yeah? You remember when we were using the two young, two whole Young's experiment, yeah? we have demonstrated yeah, that if the light is quasi monochromatic, uh, that the visibility of the fringes yeah, is simply the Fourier transform of the intensity distribution at the surface of the object. Yeah? But we have shown that for the two pinholes yeah, in the screen. No finite apertures, yeah? no real telescope, no mirrors. So here, what I do, since now we have the expression for the response function of an interferometer, yeah? we demonstrate now here that for the case of a symmetric object, yeah? the visibility of the fringes that we obtain, so OK, here we obtain some fringes. Yeah? It's just a Fourier transform yeah, of the normalized intensity distribution of the object. So we, we just uh, rigorously demonstrate what we found for the case of the two pinhole, but now adapted to the case of uh, two real telescopes yeah, composing an interferometer. Yeah. But this will be for next time, yeah, because yeah, I'm sure some of you, it's the end of the week, yeah. This is a probable reason, yeah. Friday. Yeah, yeah. Friday evening. Yes. Yeah. Now, well, Bikram, yeah, before we leave, yeah, Bikram asked me an interesting question, which was the following. Uh, 
when we are observing yeah, the star with the real telescopes, yeah, where well, there is atmosphere, yeah, all that we have stated until now is for the case of a, a mirror or interferometer in space, yeah, where there is no atmosphere. Yeah. So, what is the effect of the atmosphere yeah, when we make interferometric observations? Yeah, well, there are several effects. Yeah, the first effect is the following: you have two aperture. And then you have an atmosphere yeah, with changing conditions. Yeah? So what people, astronomers do today, they use adaptive optics. Yeah? So adaptive optics is just to correct yeah, the shape of the front wave due to the atmospheric turbulence. Yeah? So well, a good interferometer today must be equipped with adaptive optics. Yeah? It's not the case of all uh, existing interferometers yet. Yeah? So at ESO, the auxiliary telescopes yeah, measuring 1.8 meter don't have adaptive optics yet. Yeah? But the UT, the 8 meter telescope, they have adaptive optics. Yeah? OK, now this is the first problem. So let's assume you have adaptive optics here and you have adaptive optics here. Yeah? So if you now observe the interference between the two beams, what are you going to see? Ah. What you are going to see is are fringes. But the fringes in the focal plane do this. Yeah? With typical variations at the level of 10 milliseconds of time. Yeah? Why? The reason is that you have two aperture. Yeah? You have two aperture, one aperture here, one aperture here. They have adaptive optics. So the, the, the waves, the front waves which come above all the, well, when they pass through the aperture, are corrected. They are flat, no problem. But now it can be that above this telescope, where the height of the atmosphere is not the same as here, yeah. And this will introduce phase shifts, yeah. And this is the reason why, in the focal plane, yeah, you see the fringes doing this, yeah. Now you you may simulate this effect with your pinhole interferometers that you constructed, yeah. You take it. And then you take a sheet of plastic, yeah? So just a plastic. And uh, you put it, yeah? Just above it. And you will see the fringes, yeah? Flickering, translated in all the different directions, yeah? So what you would need? Well, you would need an, uh, something, yeah? A device to follow the fringes, yeah? And this is known as a fringe tracker. Fringe tracker. So engineers have been invented, yeah? Fringe tracker. So it's something yeah, which, which correct yeah, for the difference for the phase shift between the two apertures yeah, in real time. And uh, well, at the beginning at ESO, they had one such a fringe tracker called Finito. And it was the first generation fringe tracker. And well, it was not working very well. People were very much complaining about it. Yeah? Then they improved the algorithm, then they made a new design, and now they have something very good. And wh why it's important is that if you may follow the fringes, yeah, you may integrate, yeah? and then you may observe fainter objects yeah? and uh, see more details. Yeah? But people have invented yeah, fringe trackers, yeah? so it's very high technology. Okay, so see you next week. <laughs>